and welcome to Varn Blog Solo. Today, I am discussing understanding the contending classes. Are developing richer models for class analysis, not just through abstract statistical work, although that is quite useful, if, particularly when you realize that people often measure um, class in different ways in statistical work, and you have to figure out if their variables actually align to yours. In some ways, things like middle class and working class become floating signifiers when you don't do that. For the Marxist, the working class is defined by your relationship to the wage fund and the mode of production. Do you produce commodities and are you dependent on the general wage fund? Or do you own your own property? And do you subsist on the labor of others directly? The bourgeoisie. The petite bourgeoisie own their own property. Uh, it may have one or two employees, but generally do not actually subsist on the labor of others, which makes them a somewhat difficult class to contend with. Depending on the situation, they can seem very, quote, reactionary, i.e. very for the status quo, reduce social services, cutting back on anything that eats into their relatively small profit margins, but also highly dependent on rent seeking and social subsidies. This is not just an abstract consideration that we deduce mathematically. It's something we see in the real world. Look at the deficit between urban areas and rural areas of the country. How much subsidy goes into urban areas? How much subsidy goes into rural areas and where and how? So the petite bourgeois has every incentive to collect as many subsidies as possible, but since his profit margins are often low, has little incentive to pay in that many taxes. Now, I'm sure my modern monetary theorists will come in and say, ah, uh, you know, with currency, you don't have to. The government can't run out of money. We're not talking about this in terms of money. We're talking about this in terms of labor and production. And we're not trying to convert between the two. There's no transformation problem here. Even in modern monetary theory, the limit of production and the limit of its ability to be valorized is the limit of the material capacity of the society. Money is still subordinated to that, although credit and debt can help place where that is according to modern monetary theory. Now, this is beyond the scope of the day. I just wanna cut off why people don't see this in relationships to the way the petit bourgeois perceive their situation. Yes, there's macroeconomic trends that may cut against it, but they're not clear to most people in their individual lives, nor are they clear to most of us. Enter the concept of the PMC. Now, I've talked about my confusion about people who want to insist on the PMC. I had a friend of mine insist that I refuse to talk about class because I find it vague, even though I talk about class constantly, just not in the way they do. One, the working class versus the PMC versus the bourgeoisie is still too flattened. To understand the divisions in the working class itself, one must look beyond white collar and blue collar because there, there are both gender, ethnic, and most importantly and least discussed sectional divisions between labor. What benefits one area of labor will hurt another as long as profit margins are what is at stake and every laborer under a capitalist system is dependent on its employer making profits. This is a problem that socialism wishes to reduce because it's long and needs to be reduced in any socialist minimum program for immediate reforms and action. Because as long as the worker is dependent on the profits of their immediate employer, there are very few incentives that will occur to them to work across sectional lines. So dock workers and store workers may be at odds. And that is not even factoring in things like government work or green jobs versus traditional energy extraction, etc. cetera. 
But understanding these in abstract or even in ethnological studies is not enough. The same friend always reminds me of an anecdote by Lenin who says one must understand how to speak and even taste what every class you're dealing with is. And you see this in Lenin's writing. Um, I was recently reading one of his pamphlets uh, from 1902 called Political Agitation and the Class Point of View when Lenin was still on the Social Democrats. And it's interesting what he talks about, about the nature of democracy in relationship to the Social Democrats, etc. I'm going to read a second uh, part of it to you, and then I'll continue my, my discuss about what Lenin encourages socialists to do. The class character of the social democratic movement must not be expressed in the restriction of our task to direct and immediate needs of the labor movement, pure and simple. It must be expressed in, in our leadership of every aspect and every manifestation of the great struggle for liberation that is being raged by the proletariat, the only true revolutionary class in modern society. Social democracy must constantly and unswervingly spread the influence of labor to all spheres of the social and political life of political society. It must lead not only the economic, but also the political struggle of the proletariat. It must never for a moment lose sight of our ultimate goal, but always carry on propaganda for proletarian ideology. The theory of scientific socialism, viz. Marxism, guarded against distortion and helped develop it further. We must entirely combat any and every bourgeois ideology. Regardless of the fashionable and striking garb in which it may drape itself, socialists have mentioned that it must uh, mention above depart from class point of view because to a extent that they remain indifferent to the task of combating the criticism of Marxism. Only the blind fail to see the criticism has taken root more rationally in Russia than any other country and has been more enthusiastically taken up by the Russian liberal propaganda than by any other, precisely for the reason that it is one of the elements of the bourgeois, now consciously bourgeois democracy, now. Uh, now informing in Russia. It is particularly in this regard to the political struggle that the class point of view demands the proletariat give an impetus to every democratic movement. The political demands of the working class democracy do not differ in principle from those of bourgeois democracy. They differ only in degree. In the struggle for economic emancipation, for socialist revolution, the proletariat stands on the basis in principle and, stand, and it stands alone. The small producer will come to its aid only to the extent that he enters or is preparing to enter its ranks. The struggle for political revelation, however, we have many allies, towards whom we must not remain indifferent. But while allies in the bourgeois democratic camp and struggling for liberal reforms will always glance back and seek to adjust matters so that they will be able, as before, to eat well, sleep peacefully, and live merrily at other people's expense. The proletariat will march forward to the end without looking back with the conferees of RNS, haggle with the government over the rights of the authoritative Zetsmost or over the constitution, real struggle for a democratic republic. And we will not forget, however, that we must push someone forward. We must constantly, continuously keep our hands on someone's shoulders. The party of the proletariat must learn to catch every liberal just at the moment when he is prepared to move forward an inch and make him move forward a yard. If he is obstinate, we will go forward without him and over him. Implied in that, and implied in Lenin here, is that we know what the bourgeois ideology is, not just in abstract, but sensuously, where it overlines with our interest and differs. We can be united on certain particular issues, certain kinds of issues of liberation, of public development, of nationalization and socialization, which, to remind you, are always different things. But we must never sit on our laurels and forget that we need to know what bourgeois ideology is and enter the morass of the PMC. I've rejected the PMC as a class because the only clear definition I've ever been given from it is from John and Barbara Ehrenreich. And its definition are degree holders. Everyone else uses it as a stand-in for liberalism. It is a class way to explain a political ideology. Some cases it explains it, in other cases it does not. One, while much is made about the iron triangle of the NGO media 
and academic complexes, which are largely dependent on the state or state subsidy and are usually dependent on a wage fund pulled from government and that itself is either pulled from government created fiat currency or from the creation of general social surplus of production. There is no way to say that the PMC is limited to that because most people with degrees do not go into those sectors. While the public sector is an increasing part of the general employment, in fact, the government probably employs more, included in that is the military and the police, all civic workers, even those without degrees, municipal workers, etc. When discussing the PMC, even though James Burnham whose conception John and Barbara Ehrenreich were trying to tie into a Marxist one, undoing Burnham's defection in some ways. Burnham's managerial classes were the managers for stockholders, the actual management, people that people like Alfred Sun Rethal blamed, on, blamed as a core material supporter for fascism as opposed to fascism's lumpen and petty bourgeois mass base. And Burnham agreed. But Burnham found the Madonna Giro classes everywhere in Soviet nomenclatura, in Chinese party bureaucracy, and in the U.S. military, which is the managerial elite that Burnham himself decided to rest the development of modern bourgeois America on. And, of course, his prediction was that there would be a thousand Eisenhowers, and there was only one. We always take our own time as definitive for all times if we are not careful. Nonetheless, that is the beginning, and it's a very right-wing beginning, of the idea of a managerial class. Now, something being tied to the right-wing does not mean it is wrong. And the division of labor, the alienation of laborers from each other, through competition and through even developments of internal habitats, conspicuous consumption, social categories and codes within workers. That kind of competition, which alienates us from each other and makes it harder for us to work together, runs throughout the system. Dealing with workers as an undifferentiated mass who have immediate common interest is to misunderstand them. To understand their common interest in themselves gives us our ability to break those differences, fix those contradictions of themselves. But it also means we have to look more materially and not just in abstract at things like the bourgeoisie. Which elements of the bourgeoisie are dominant? Asset managers, tech investors, etc., and indeed, you can explain a lot of our actual politics by the urban and rural poor picking sides between these two parts of the greater bourgeoisie and the managerial sections of society and the professional sections of society aligning with them. But they are different. And when you try to flatten them out with an overbroad conception like the PMC, you do not understand them. I actually think a non-Marxist like Michael Lynn gives us a better framework if we do a little tweaking and fit it back in with Marx. And don't think that Michael Lind is describing the overall classes, right? As in he's not concerned necessarily with, with people's relationship to the production of social life. He is concerned with opportunity capture, skills hoarding, and political power. So I'm Michael Lynn, and you can get this from his book, The New Class War. He sees there being an overclass. He doesn't call it the bourgeoisie. He includes the very elite of fiduciary management in that. Uh, professionals on one side, often who work for the state, are for large corporations. The large corporations can handle the tax burden that is imposed on them, and they even somewhat like it because it reduces competition for them artificially. 
without them actually trying to do traditional monopoly capture, which is just buying up all their competition, basically reducing their overhead. On the other, and within the professionals, there are professionals who are closer to the proletariat and further away. Uh, in a critique of Peter Church and Christian Parenti, uh, actually talks about this. Now, I like a lot of Turchin's work, but I've always thought Turchin had three major failures. One, he treats the working class as inert. Everything is about elites and counter elites. Two, he is methodologically nationalist. So events that happen that, that actually regard you to look at a world system are treated as discrete within a nation, such as um, the Civil War or um, why there was a post-war social compact. He treats them as totally discreet within the United States, uh, at least in the two books I've read of his, Ages of Discord and End Times. Um, oh, and I've also read Secular Cycles, and he kind of does that there. So two and three, he doesn't really theorize what the state is. Now, basically... Parenti deals with the fact that the PMC has a more complicated relationship to the state, even as it is splitting in two. And some of the more resentment of, say, the blue collar working class life is held in professionals like teachers who, who both have compassion for, but kind of contempt for being controlled by people in which they serve. And my experience of that is that's true enough. No, a teacher will admit they have contempt for, for their community until they talk about the parents they have to deal with. Admittedly themselves, parents often treat kids as just extensions of their own selves and property, and this exacerbates the tension. I'm going to read a section of Turchin's critique, I mean, of Parenti's critique of Turchin. The problem at the heart of end times is well known and much discussed story. The collapse of the post-war social compromise led to the great compression in the decades after the New Deal, where American inequality, great, American inequality greatly diminished. How and why that arrangement ended opening up an expanding gap between the rich and everyone else. The weakness of Turchin's answer comes from his superficial economic history of the United States since 1945. Relying on the work of economist Thomas Piketty, Turchin makes reference to what he calls the wealth pump, a self-reinforcing dynamic of upward economic redistribution. But he basically ignores how much of the literature on post-war political economy explains how and why the New Deal compromise ended, beginning with the, with the old books Capitalism Since 1945 by Philip Armstrong, Andrew Glenn, and John Harrison, and Barry Bl Bluestone's and Bennett Harrison's The Deindustrialization of America, and carrying on with works by David Harvey, Peter Gowan, Robert Brenner, and Bob Poland, heterodox political economists have produced an increasingly detailed picture of what happened and why. Tershin's work would have, it, would have been stronger if he absorbed this literature and incorporated his conclusions into his analysis. Since he didn't, here's a thumbnail sketch. The Great Compression was rooted in the reforms of the New Deal and the most expansion of union power, but it was, it was World War II and the subsequent... Uh, in the subsequent American-led global effort to rebuild and sustain relatively egalitarian boom of the post-war decades. I'm going to add to it a, a bit more of analysis to uh, Parenti here. Um, it was also the fact that the U.S. didn't lose most of its wealth in World War II, while, while um, Europe definitely did thus leaving 60% of the valorizable wealth in the world in the U.S. Not because the U.S. even stole it, although it did steal a lot of it, and of course the whole continent, being a settler or colonial project, was a type of direct and explicit and ongoing accumulation, but also just because it didn't lose it. It was the... It could then take its excess production and send it to Europe to build up a Keynesian international to use the words of Parmatic, while making sure that that did not spread to Latin America so you could use it as a resource dump and the spear of the Monroe Doctrine. Anyway, so the understanding the origins of American imperialism and the kind of 
rational core of the labor aristocracy theories by malice. But of course, when they picked that up, this was already over. The American industrial capacity doubled in five years between 1940 and 1945. In 1946, the U.S. produced half the world's total output. By the 1950s, America still produced one-third of the global economic output. The historically unique conditions of this golden era meant that American industry could pay high wages and high taxes and yet still book very high profits. However, by the mid-1960s, Germany and Japan recovered. Their labor costs were much higher than those in the in the United were much lower than those in the United States, and their capital stock tended to be newer and more efficient. Not only were the Europeans and the Japanese supplying their own domestic markets, but they were ramping up their exports. And at the same time, American consumer spending began to level out by the mid-1960s. Once exotic luxuries like full-size refrigerators and electric vacuums became commonplace, the post-war shopping spree was winding down, and its drop in profits occurred with it. By the early 1970s, therefore, growth and industrialization of the early decades led to a, crisis, a classic crisis of overproduction and overaccumulation. Thank you, Parenti. Suddenly, there was too much production capacity and too much capital, too many commodities already in existence, and not enough opportunities for the profitable reinvestment. American capitalism was suffocating from its industrial success. As Marx put it long ago, modern bourgeois society that has conjured up such gigantic means of production and of exchange is like a sorcerer who can no longer control the powers of the netherworld of which he has called up by his spells. During the inevitable crisis of overproduction, there was suddenly too much of means of assistance, too much industry, too much commerce, the productive force at the disposal of society no longer tend to tend to the further development of the conditions of bourgeois property. On the contrary, they endangered the existence of bourgeois property. And by the early 1970s, this expressed itself as stagflation, a rising crisis combined with high unemployment and sluggish growth. As I said, now we're gonna, I think we're gonna be living in an era of relatively high inflation uh, and sluggish growth but maybe not high employment just from a lack of population. <laughs> Most importantly, the crisis of OB accumulation expressed itself as a collapse in the average after tax profit rates. By 1973, the average profit rates were only about a third of what they had been in the mid sixties. When business attempted to restore profits by cutting wages, it was thwarted by massive militant trade union counteroffensive. 1974 saw more walk, work stoppages than any year since 1953. The resolution to this crisis came in the end. This came from a new class war waged from above. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher were his charismatic leaders, and Paul Volcker, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, which is financial executioner. By 1980-81, Volcker had hijacked the federal funds rate to 20% from around 9% in 1979. The massive contraction in the credit triggered that was what was at the time the worst recession since the Great Depression, until 2007 made it worse. Unemployment soared above 10%. Simultaneously, Reagan, Thatcher, and their imitators across the globe cut taxes on the rich, raised taxes on the working class consumption, deregulated whole industries, and eviscerated health and safety regulations. Financial speculation boomed, which in turn drove deindustrialization as foreigners merged and rationalized. It was at this point that American class structure began the radical bifurcation as the middle class was hollowed out. Latertian really seems to have in mind when discussing the surplus elites in American context and what the readers seem to take him to be referring to is the growth of the proletarianized knowledge worker who form an intellectual, an influential, but increasingly beleaguered stratum. The downwardly mobile members of what Barber and John Ehrenreich call the professional managerial class poses some bureaucratic and ideological power, but have long been losing autonomy and economic power along with the rest of the middle class. As the Ehrenreichs explained in a 2013 pamphlet, The Death of the Yuppie Dream, by 2010, more than half of the practicing U.S. physicians were directly employed by hospitals, compared to only 24% of doctors who were salaried employees in 1983. Uh, which is a major... I'm just going to add this. This is me talking. That's a big shift. All right. That's a shift from petty bourgeois professionals to labor aristocratic professionals. And that's a shift that is under notice. The situation for lawyers is similar. Around 1960, most were sole practitioners that worked for small firms. Fewer than 40 law firms employed more than 55 or more lawyers. Six decades later, 42% of all practicing lawyers work in one of the biggest 250 firms or in other industrial settings, corporations, uh, government, and non-profit sectors. In other words, the old petty bourgeoisie, which enjoyed the economic autonomy through ownership of small businesses, has been increasingly absorbed into large organizations owned and controlled by wealthier or more powerful industries and has seen its working conditions and economic 
status degraded in the process. This is Varn interjecting. This is the same pattern we saw in this shift from petty proprietor capital in the 18th, in the early 18th century to the beginnings of the industrial capital in the 19th and early 20th century. The PMC term fits Turchin's definition of elites because, to a varying degree, it wields bureaucratic and ideological power. But members of the PMC increasingly do so as precarious workers settle with educational housing and medical debt, bullied by employers, and bereft of any resort to the social safety net. These downwardly mobile professionals have degrees in social capital and have boutique taste in music, food, clothing, and art that reflect their cultural capital, but they have nonetheless are members of a struggling middle class. In classical Marxist political comedy, economy they aren't even that they are just workers despite advanced training who don't own their own means of production and therefore must sell their labor to survive crucially this distinguishes them from the old petty bourgeoisie who did own their own small businesses and operate as independent lawyers accountants engineers architects and doctors parenti who accepts the pmc thesis actually points out that a great majority of the pmc are workers it is a subjective condition born out of the objective conditions of social stratification that creates this appearance of a class. But it is not a class separately. And knowing that is crucial to understanding why there are so many people with degrees, but only really a small group of Nepo baby elites who are fucking everything up. And this was what has led me to my position. I, I was talking to an older friend of mine uh, at a socialist meeting online, his friend from New York, and we were debating how incompetent I thought our, our leaders were. And I was actually pointing out outside of the military where there's still some relative meritocratic balance, although it's incre increasingly nepotized itself, um, that there's not a lot of proof of competence in the overall managerial classes. And I do say managerial classes because I do think these people often uh, are in a hybrid class because they own capital. Right? This is different from the broader PMC of John and Barbara Ehrenreich. And this is what I call the rational core of the PMC thesis. These are the actual elites people who have social and cultural capital and also material capital and can hoard income. Everyone with a credential cannot do that. And if you know the working class, you'll see this very clearly. But this also leads us to another problem. All right. But I'm going to finish reading this critique of Turchin. Barbara Ehrenreich entitled her 1989 book on the professional managerial class fear of falling. And since the neoliberal assault began, that fear has abs has been absolutely rational. Politically, Aaron Reich found these downwardly mobile professionals to be increasingly resentful of the poor and working class were also hewing closer to the cultural and political sensibilities of real elites. As American stru uh, class structure began to pluralize, middle class taste increasingly imitated those of the rich, out went Bud Reiser into a casserole and came a low and Cambert. These tendencies are also evidence in the political name domains across most recent elections, the professional class leans increasingly towards the Democratic Party. In the same period, it has evolved into a party most closely aligned with the true elites of the Davos class. This is where Parenti gets sloppy. A recent Pew survey found white voters with college degrees who were far more likely to vote Republican than people of color with college degrees had tilted Republican for several decades, but in the past four elections have favored Democratic candidates 52% to 47% in 2022. The alacrity which much of this class has, especially in the age of Trump, embraced fear-mongering about the right rabble of the heartland while aligning itself with elite preferences has made it an ideal consistency for an emerging authoritarian politics of the center. This breaks us to the greatest weakness of the end times. Turchin never attempts to theorize the state. I swear I agree with um, Parenti. I think Parenti uh, moves back and forth between Marxist theories of class and non-Marxist theories of class. And he, he's aware he's doing it, unlike a lot of people, but he doesn't always point it out like he did in that PMC piece. But it's important, all right? When I attack the PMC thesis, it is not because I think there is not, there is not an elite who is not the bourgeoisie 
who is handling things. But I think we have to deal with the differences in them. And I'm going to point out a difference in a minute because it's pretty crucial to understanding the current situation and why things like HR reflects academia isn't always true. Even if it's scolding and cultural capital may taste the same on first bite, when you actually process it, it is rather different. In America, there now exists one of the most powerful states in human history. It is so well-funded, amply and ably staffed, technologically sophisticated, and legally empowered that its methods and means of social control are quantitatively different than they were even in 1980. Instead of the sort of truly destabilizing political upheaval Turchin has long been predicting, the 2020s have seen the rise of a new seemingly apolitical totalitarianism in which mostly the democratic politicians and closely aligned private and public entities have massively expanded the surveillance and censorship apparatus built up under the Bush administration in the name of combating foreign terrorism and thus this apparatus against the American industry. This has involved novel forms of cooperation between private corporations, nonprofits, and the government, but in the lead are the state security intelligence policing agencies. Worse yet, as surveillance and ship and repression increase, so too has consent for such measures. A recent Pew poll found that 60% of Americans support tech companies moderating false information online, 55% support the U.S. government taking these steps, even if it limits people from freely publishing or accessing information. As recently as 2018, Pew found that only 39% of Americans supported government censorship. What explains this drastic shift towards acceptance of censorship? It seems likely that the successful propaganda campaigns of successive administrations, stoking fields of terrorism, the misinformation, viral infection, and other dangers play a bit of a role. And as an asterisk, that doesn't mean those dangers weren't real. It just means keeping you more afraid of them than you probably should be is important. This is why catastrophism is not good for the left or for Marxists or for socialists. If you don't want to be part of the left, but you're still a socialist, I didn't really care. These names have no real essence to me. They move and shift. Marxism has a pretty clear historical tradition rooted in a couple of different things. And of the three things I mentioned is the easiest to talk about. We know what we're dealing with methodologically and our goals with Marxism. Socialism is broader, but generally means equals the removal of inequality, the, the, the increased democratization of work and a tendency to want to get rid of, class distinctions, and then communism is even more broader as the goal to remove class distinctions entirely, um, to remove even the need for democratization over time, and to expand democracy beyond mere political administration. If war is the health of the state, then it seems that domestic political unrest can justify the growth of domestic security state. It's not hard to worry that the structural tensions scrub attention rather than laying the groundwork for eventual regime change are doing just that. In this case, the danger comes not from surplus elites, but from a super empowered elite who, in the face of extreme inequity, feel their privileges threatened and through the bloated security state are seeking the role in an increasing undemocratic and unaccountable fashion and succeeding. The PMC's feel of failing rather than prompting revolt fuels the politics of elite social control. If downward mobile professionals see themselves as, as cultural elites because of their tastes and degrees, and to see the threat of social stability as coming from growing ranks of the immiserated and left behind, behind the current economic order, then siding with the state rep repression may seem quite rational. This formula can work for both left and right branches of the professional class. Right-wingers fear immigrants and urban black people, liberal professionals fear white gun loving deplorables, and in the end, it all adds up to the same reactionary middle-class politics endorses repression of the many in the interest of a few. I'm going to end there because I think Parenti is actually right. Resisting that binary is hard. And I think it's harder than just in the PMC. If you look at the voting patterns of workers in these areas, you will see an a seeming bifurcation with more and more workers opting out. That's to be expected. Both the economic and social interest of their, of their immediate peers ties into their economic and social interest, even if there's tensions between them. And since at least the lower end 
of what we can call this professional managerial strata. And I think calling it a strata is much clearer than calling it a, a class. And its divisions among itself, as the petite bourgeois is dying, leaves us in a particularly bad situation. The petite bourgeois, which should see itself in struggles for the working class as it is proletarianized, has no incentive to see itself as that in this country. Instead, it sees itself as besieged and alone. And in many cases, it is, because even the working class in that era is overly immiserated. In fact, in some of these eras, one of the biggest things you'll notice is the absence of work. Or the absence of good work. A decline in working hours because there's less work to be done in these areas. Particularly as military largesse and the end of military Keynesianism under Bush has continued unabated with moving from people to drones. Socialists, to take this seriously, don't just need to abstractly tell everyone to join a union, although they should. They don't need just to tell everyone to vote for socialist candidates because, frankly, there's no socialist party and they will be subordinated by this class until we have one. Nor can we just conjure one from political will out of the remnants of the DSA, 60 to 80,000. Remember, we are in a country of over 320 million. In fact, Moms for Liberty is bigger than the DSA. And it's still a kind of a fringe group. We must do workers' inquiry and understand these divisions more. We must listen to what people need and answer that question. We must protect everyone as best we can. Sacrifice no one. Discussions of identity preferences that ask people to lay down who they are is a non-starter. Whether they be trans or Christian. Nor can we make those tensions just go away. They're not going to. I'm not an idealist or a utopian. I don't think you can just wish them away by saying class unity. But the way you deal with this problem is overcoming alienation. And the way you overcome an alienation is common projects, both local and through those locals, eventually building a program, both with immediate demands, for the betterment of working class lives now, and the creation of our own independent political efficacy, which will be fought tooth and nail. And eventually, in consolidating those programs and working with socialist allies to build a program that is responsive to the broader class, of which the leadership will be accountable to the class. And that is one problem with the current skills. Because people with professional skills have been inculcated in a fear of the poor and are unwilling to bow down to them. They must lead but they need to be subjugated to the needs of the class. To the needs of survival. Radical sloganeering that is premature and held piecemeal will be unimplementable. And we will be held accountable for our failure. Do you see why socialism is slightly less popular now than it was four years ago? Because progressivism is a lot less popular and we are not seen as different from them, rightly. We must do workers' inquiry. And we must do inquiry into all the classes to understand the divisions, not just abstractly, but we need to be able to taste them. <laughs>
people with skills need to help people who don't have them. Because one of the big issues of the working class and of the PMC, if you want to call it that, of these of these white collar workers who feel like they have capital is their specialization limits their ability to do work. Tools that would be beneficial for reducing work and helping us in a non-capitalist society will oppress us in the capitalist one. We need to learn how to use them to our own advantage. Immediate demands and immediate duties and responsibilities. These are what we have to offer. But they have to be real. And people have to actually get something from it other than an ideological identity. We also need large blocks to deal with the militarization of our society because the militarization of our society is subtle and nearly silent. I've talked lots about how important this is to see how much role the military actually plays in U.S. society while few people are in it. And particularly as military Keynesianism has reduced things like the poverty draft, which was a real thing in the 90s and 80s and even early aughts, but is not now. Ask yourself, what does this all mean? How do we know it? How do we speak to it? Because if we don't, the right will, it'll give people lies and division and false hope. And it won't actually solve their problems, but we haven't. So what's the gamble? If you actually want to fight rising fascism, that's what you do. All hands on deck does not mean supporting the status quo, no matter what. And with that, good night. I'll have links in the show notes.